So good morning and welcome again for the first session of day two. Uh, may I have the moderators, uh, Dr. Vada Shakir, Professor Supakon, Professor Luizi Angrisani. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I really thanks very much uh, Vinod Shingal to, or, to have organized such a beautiful and interesting uh, meeting uh, combination of uh, Eastern, uh, Western Europe, uh, and the uh, mm, Middle East. And it's a pleasure for me to start this session this morning introducing a very actual and dramatic uh, situation in all uh, our hospitals around the world, modern technique for diagnosis and treatment of acute uh, necrotic pancreatitis. This paper will be taken by Professor Luc Michel. Please. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, in historical analysis, you never know which interpretation, interpretation of yesterday will be made. Well, actually, in this uh, difficult topic, uh, there are not really true strong recommendations, which is a, quite a problem. As you know, acute pancreatitis in 70% will remain interstitial with rather, rather spontaneous resolution. 30% will evolve in necrotizing process and with all the problem of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome and the acute toxema that will be treated mainly medically. Among the 30% of the necrotizing process, 50% will get infected at some stage and some of those cases will require surgery. This is, we don't have time to go into detail about the SIRS, the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, and I go directly to the treatment. The treatment is mainly intensive care management of severe acute pancreatitis. This is maybe the only strong recommendation that can be made about those acute situations. I can also begin by a conclusion. Conclusion in the current opinion in critical care from 2010, in which you can read, the current approach to care of patients with acute pancreatitis requires close cooperation between intensivist, surgeon, gastroenterologist, an interventional radiologist familiar with care of this complex patient. And the challenge is much more in the choice of the right indication for surgery, why and when, than in the appropriate choice of the operative, the operative approach, which is the how. Which are the causes of acute pancreatitis? Well, in Europe, it's mainly ethanol abuse. The second uh, cause is cholecholithiasis, or biliary lithiasis. For instance, in my country, as far as alcohol is concerned, Belgium can propose one different beer for each day of the year. I just uh, learned from Professor Richway that uh, it's not anymore the case in Ireland. They switch to wine. Uh, those are the most aggressive beer, which are different beer, uh, beer from Habay, produced by the monks. So we have to be very careful when a Belgian guy is drinking this kind of beer. And uh, last December, I was invited to speak about the same topic, I didn't know why, in Minsk, Belarus and I felt like the Titanic facing the iceberg because the number of acute necrotic pancreatitis in Belarus is absolutely terrible and tremendous because of the vodka. Some less frequent uh, etiology is the pancreas divisum. That was 
a fear of the surgeon in, uh, in the 70s between, uh, b before we had all the anti-acid drugs, when we had to operate and do a bilirubin too, if there, was, if there was an accessory pancreatic duct, the Santorini duct, we were always afraid to ligate this duct and to get a postoperative pancreatitis. But this is probably not a very big problem anymore now. But just remind, if you have to do a B2, it happened from time to time. If you get a pancreatitis after that, it's probably because you ligate a Santorini duct. Trauma, well, trauma actually is uh, quite also an etiology, mainly in youngster and in young kids without complete rupture of the duct. The pancreas is broken on the vertebra, just like this monkey is breaking a piece of wood on another piece of wood. And that can happen with the handlebar of a bicycle if you have uh, amylase and lipase in those kits, thanks to the pancreas. Look what this kid is doing with, with his bicycle. Well, I am always concerned about something that can happen to the pancreas. Another example, that's a youngster. He can have broken leg and ankle, but uh, he, if he has some abdominal problem, not clear enough the first day, always think pancreas. After, motor accident, after motorcycle accident, well, one simple qu question, importance of the little detail would have say Sherlock Holmes just the size of the engine. Now, recognition of severe acute pancreatitis. We have a clinical sign like the very uh, traditional gray Turner sign, which is the bruising of the flank, which may be indicative of pancreatic necrosis with retroperitoneal or intra-abdominal bleeding. Very nice Turner sign. The Cullen sign, which is hemorrhagic discoloration around the umbilicus. This sign takes 24 to 48 hours to appear and can predict acute pancreatitis with a mortality rising up to 40%. This is a clinical sign that is very worrying. Prognosis indicator for acute pancreatitis. Well, there was a new indicator almost every decade since the 70s, as you can see here. The Apache adapted to the pancreatitis. The prognostic factor from the Glasgow score, the IMRE score in the 80s, with some mnemonic technique, easy to, remi to, to remember about the biological and clinical status of the patient. The ransom score, probably the most uh, uh, well-known and the oldest from the 70s. The ransom score that should be computed on admission and repeat after two days. And you can see that the relation between the ransom score and the mortality is quite uh, significant. Organ failure, of course, when you have organ failure with acute pancreatitis, it's always a bad progno prognostic indicator. In either scoring system, the presence of three or more criteria indicates severe pancreatitis, which is associated with a higher mortality. And the last score is the Atlanta classification in 1993, with a revision in 2013, and the last revision is just mentioning that persistent organ failure for more than two days means severe acute pancreatitis. In other words, what is simple is full, what is not is useless. And in geographical analysis, you never know which interpretation of ear will be made. If I show you those pictures here, maybe you are in the street of Paris. Here you are maybe in Switzerland. No, you are just in Dubai. It's all the same for the interpretation of the pancreatitis severity score. Paper published 
1997, the prognosis indicator for acute pancreatitis, the best indicator is the clinical impression of a good clinician used to deal with acute pancreatitis. Detailed clinical and laboratory protocol designed to assess severity have no major advantage over clinical assessment. And the next sentence, the contrast in enhanced computer tomography scan is important to assess the degree of pancreatic necrosis and to detect local complication. So let's move to the CT scan. CT scan, well, it's a good initial assessment tool, but you should remember that CT should not be performed before the first 12 hours of onset of symptoms because the first day it can still be rather normal. The CT is recommended also and above all as a delayed assessment tool to follow the acute change in status, to determine therapeutic response to the different treatment and before discharging the patient uh, who is doing well because he had the time to develop collection. Some example here, you have this famous fascia of Gerota. You have fluid collection behind the pancreas, in front of the pancreas, but you also have some collection behind the Gerota fascia, which can be some, a sign of severity. The Balthazar grade for CT scan 1990, it's a good classification taking into account the grading of the pancreatitis, but also the extent of the pancreatic necrosis. And these two uh, factors are computed to get, in the worst case, a maximum of 10. For example, two or more poorly defined fluid collection in this case, it's a grade A of uh, uh, Balthazar classification without, at this stage, without necrosis. So it's not a big and very severe cases. You can also find in the literature the severity classified according to the Balthazar score. Another classification that was used in the 80s and that I have been using for more than 20 years in the 70s and the 80s was the ill classification of acute pancreatitis, which was quite useful at this stage. For instance, a grade five, it's a phlegmonous extension into the posterior pararenal space and in the pelvis, you can also find some extra pancreatic calcification and collection. Now, the problem of the CT scan, in those patients who will probably evolve to uh, renal failure, is that the prob you have also the problem of contrast-induced nephropathy, which is a byproduct of the dramatic increase in the use of CT scan with injection. So, for the last uh, decade, we have now the MRI. The MRI is useful in case of allergy to CT contrast material and to prevent acute renal failure. Very useful to define duct anomalies or anatomical variation. Biliary sludge also can be uh, seen on the MRI and it's also a much less invasive technique than the ERCP but the ERCP can be also therapeutic. Here we are just diagnostic. Recognition and assessment of the extent of the necrosis by the CT scan, well, that leads us to terminology. What is sterile necrosis, walt of necrosis? What is infected necrosis? What is pancreatic abscess? Well, to compute and to use properly all those terms, required to combine X-ray criteria with clinical evaluation and clinical criteria. The wall of pancreatic necrosis is a well-defined inflammatory wall that contains varying amount of fluid and debris. Those are probably the good case to be, to be drained endoscopically. Extension of the necrosis. Well, the extension of the necrosis can go 
in all the direction. All the direction, and you will be faced then with some situation in which you will have to consider some kind of debridement. When you have a symptomatic sterile necrosis with a complete gastric outlet obstruction, maybe you will have to do some kind of debridement. If the necrosis get infected, then you should consider also debridement, debridement but as, as late as you can. So I come again to one of my first slides. The challenge is much more in the choice of the right indication for surgery, the why and when, than in the appropriate choice of the operative approach, I mean the how. But the main treatment is intensive care management, and I will go through this quickly. Basic medical therapy, major fleet replacement requirement during the first day, prevention of infection, nutritional intervention before even considering any surgical step. In the 90s, the role of surgery, according to Ransom, was still very aggressive. Drainage in all direction, placement of drain also in every uh, cavities, it was a very aggressive with a very bad result in terms of morbidity and mortality. The basic medical therapy is mainly aimed at treating the systemic inflammatory response syndrome by cardiosecretory, respiratory, and renal support, metabolic resuscitation, fluid sequestration. Is there still room for peritoneal lavage? Well, in my experience, mainly with alcohol-related pancreatitis and early distant organ failure, we are still using peritoneal lavage. Abdominal <coughs> pressure measurement also at the same time. And you can see the evolution of the fluid after some uh, episode of uh, peritoneal lavage. You are really getting a lot of toxic product out of the abdomen of the patient. Thoracic duct drainage. We use that in the 80s and in the 70s. Uh, this is very uh, controversial now. However, however, there is a new uh, study published from China about the blocking abdominal lymphatic flow attenuates acute hemorrhagic necrotizing, but it's an experimental study on rats. So maybe there will be a second life for the thoracic drainage in the future. Prevention of infection, well, there are a lot of literature against and for, so I cannot make a definitive uh, recommendation about prevention of, of infection. Nutritional support is also important because uh, you have to control the infection, but also all the metabolic effect. Severe acute pancreatitis, the pathway of infection generally will follow the same pathway as the extension of necrosis. And you have to take also into account and never forget that you have all the potential source of catheter-related sepsis in those, pa in those patients who are for weeks, sometimes in the ICU. Infection rate, the longer the duration of the evolution the, long, the more infection you will get. The more necrosis, the more infection also you will get. The nutritional intervention, well, for mild pancreatitis, supportive care, fluid resuscitation, and analgesia. For severe pancreatitis, you, can, you will need some kind of nutritional support, and you should choose, first of all, the total enteral nutrition. Never, I should not say never, but not very frequently, you should deal with total parenteral nutrition, except if you have intolerance to the total enteral nutrition. Total enteral nutrition can easily be done by a nasogenal feeding tube that can be placed under fluoroscopy, and that can be very useful to support the patient. Management of the infected necrosis, 
Well, first you have to identify the infected necrosis, and then you should maybe <coughs> consider the debridement of the infected necrosis. Although the evidence regarding surgical management of acute pancreatitis remain in many ways inconclusive, data to be published in the coming year are likely to contribute significantly to our approach to this complex problem that was written five years ago, but they are, they are, there is not many change since. When you have to identify the infected necrosis, well, consider CT or ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, multiple sampling, avoid transgastric or transcolic punction, always aerobic and anaerobic culture, and the specimen should be transported to the bacteriological lab immediately and avoid systematic percutaneous drainage. Two years ago, in uh, Malta, during the ESS meeting, there was a very nice communication about this topic from the uh, John Radcliffe Hospital from Oxford. And the, the summary of this paper was about early aggressive hydration, oxygen supplementation, re reassessment after 48 hours, Antibiotic, antibiotic if infection in necrotic tissue, soft tissue as soon as possible and avoid TPN as much as possible. ERCP is no more a treatment tool. Cholecystectomy of gallstone, interrogation mark. You should defer until active inflammation settles. And for infected necrosis, well, you should consider debridement and necrosectomy as late as possible and certainly not before three to four weeks after admission. Those were basically the rules that I get from this presentation from the Radcliffe Hospital. The world of pancreatic necrosis, well, that can, as I told you, be drained and uh, on, on, in front of such case, your, gastro, your gastroenterologist will get mad. He will be most willing to treat that by draining it through the gastric pouch. Here you have a nice case before draining through the stomach and here after draining. The multiple transluminal gateway technique, placing a lot of uh, this uh, little device to enlarge the drainage orifice between the pancreatic collection and the pancreatic necrosis and the stomach. This is a smaller one that was drained, localized ultrasonography by ultrasonography and drained by gastroscopy by just one pigtail. Uh, it was working, but one pigtail is probably not working for big drainage and big necrosis. Self-expandable metal stand. Gastroenterologists like that also. And you can drain. When the necrosis com is completely liqui liquefied, then you can drain it through the stomach. Here you can see the self-expandable metal stand placed in the gastric and the uh, gastric porch and the pancreas. So I will conclude because there is, some, there is still some room left for retropedal necrosectomy. The retropedal necrosectomy, it's a surgical approach, can be a tiny incision to drain the retroperitoneum. It avoids infecting the a transperitoneal incision. It allow easy reopening of the wound in case of early closure. And you will get no soiling of the peritoneal cavity if pancreatic, duodenal, or colonic fistula appears. And that's sometimes the case. This retroperitoneal necrosectomy and drainage can be done either by an endoscopic approach or by an open surgical approach. 
Here it's an endoscopic approach. You can see that things are really improving with several episodes of endoscopic drainage. An open surgical approach, I'm still practicing that from time to time. We enter the retroperitoneal ca cavity by a subcoastal oblique incision. And this is one of the recent case. It was a 36-year-old policeman. This is the CT scan on D1. That's on D13. Then he had a duodenal obstruction. We had to put a feeding jejunostomy. He had a complete distension of the sacrum. We had to do also a sacostomy. That's on D33. There was an hemorrhage in the necrotic uh, area. Fortunately, the hemorrhage subsided spontaneously. And we did a retroperitoneal drainage on day 90. An open drainage. You can see here the placement of the drain. Amazingly enough, when we consider the long-term evolution of this patient, this is the CT scan after three years. And this guy is doing fine. He has not even a diabetes. So open retropedial approach can still be used. And when you have a wound that is healing slowly, now you, we can use the vacuum-assisted closure that will increase and facilitate the uh, cicatrization of the wound. The final things I want to tell you, it's a paper coming from China, again, published in the Scandinavian, Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology. It's nothing new except that it's on a huge series of almost 10,000 patients with acute pancreatitis, 412 necrosectomy, 108 by a retroperitoneal approach and 300 by open transperitoneal approach. Nothing surprising, but it's a definite uh, result. Mortality, 8 versus 20%. Complication rate, significantly different in favor of the retroperitoneal approach. Duration in the ICU is also significantly different, as well as the duration of hospital stay. And the conclusion of this paper is that the retroperitoneal pancreatic necrosectomy approach reduced the rate of complication and death among patients with infected necrosis compared with open transperitoneal necrosectomy. So the final conclusion is that the current approach to care of patients with acute pancreatitis require close cooperation between intensivist, surgeon, gastroenterologist, and interventional radiologist familiar with care of this complex patient. Appropriate timing of delayed necrosectomy is only possible in the context of abdominal supportive care in the early phase of the disease. Patient selection for ne necrosectomy based on patient condition, habitus, imaging, microbiology findings, and anatomic feature of pancreatic necrosis require close communication between these different disciplines. The choice of procedure rests on the technical expertise of the treating team and should involve consultation between disciplines. Regardless of the approach to necrosectomy selected, it is clear that multiple procedures may be required and may also require conversion to an open approach in the case of procedural failure or severe complication. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Professor Paul Richway uh, from Ireland. He is now a professor of surgery in Trinity College, Dublin. His presentation will be the challenge in minimally invasive surgery for pancreas training. Professor Richway, please. Good morning to you all. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Singal first for inviting me today to your wonderful city. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing more and more of it over the coming couple of days. 
but obviously in between the lectures. I've been asked to talk to you about the challenges in pancreas minimally invasive surgical training, um, which might seem an odd topic, uh, particularly with a lot of clinical stuff around it, but I will hope to, to share with you my thoughts and indeed the thoughts of, of, of Manny and the UEMS and, and others uh, with regard to the necessity that we do approach it in a modern way. First, my disclosures. Um, I have uh, links with both Merck Sharp and Dome and Abbott Salve, but I won't be discussing any of their products today. So to commence, in terms of ordering your operation at home, we're not quite there yet. Uh, there's no app on my phone yet that will be able to do an appendicectomy or indeed a necrosectomy for me, but we're not probably far off. In any training lecture, you'd be very familiar with people talking about how we can learn from other industries, and I have the obligatory aviation slide in early, but I promise you it's the only one. Uh, there'll be no more mentions of pilots or pilot training. However, we do need to, to get some information from other high-risk industries to, to see really where we are in our surgical training spectrum. So briefly this morning, I'm just going to discuss the vista of surgical training with special relevance to hepatopancreatic obiliary surgery, but also briefly discuss the perils of MIS strategies in surgical oncology and perhaps a touch on where we've learned from other disease sites. And then obviously the promise of technology will be forefront. So you'll all be aware in the last decade or so, there has been significant advances in what we understand about surgical training. And it's equally applicable for gastroenterology training as well. We're more aware of what, what the various roles that are uh, important in uh, competent doctors, both by work early in the Canadian colleges, but also now across the world. And we're also aware of the complexities around crew resource management in so-called high-risk industries, such as nuclear industry and indeed our own. There are, however, significant pressures, pressures that weren't perhaps seen in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where, where training was, 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 was more streamlined. Now, not only do we have a rapid advance in technologies, but we also have in various different districts a fashion or a trend towards working time limitations. I'm not sure if they apply here in Dubai, but certainly across Europe and across the United States and indeed Canada, we're seeing society not accepting the previous work-life balances in our surgical trainees. So we're having to face a surgical trainee who is spending less time at the coal face, so to speak, less time with patients, less time in the operating theater. Almost in attention to this, we also have increased societal expectation regarding outcomes. Gone are the days where it is acceptable to do an operation where there's a 10% or more mortality rate. We now are searching for operations that have mortality rates near zero. And these are operations that frequently might have been associated with significantly more um, than, than that. The other tension is the more for the change in training. Certainly in the UK and Ireland where I trained, we were very, very um, uh, in, uh, inbred in terms of how long it takes to train. Frequently, it would take 15 years plus to go from freshly qualified doctor to consulting or attending surgeon. And this is no longer acceptable. No longer acceptable by society, no longer acceptable by the healthcare funders, but also no longer acceptable by the surgical trainees. We have to streamline care. And the UK followed a, a North American model fairly early on in streamlining their care. And, and Ireland has, has, has recently followed suit. In this streamlined uh, training pathways, we have to have developed adjuncts, and significant adjuncts have been developed over recent times. They've largely based around simulation, ranging from low to high fidelity simulation, mimicking what the trainee will be seeing in the operating theater, or mimicking um, uh, environments whereby they will learn without actually being in front of the patient. One such project that is str strongly supported by the UMS and my August uh, speaking colleagues, Professor Papalos and uh, Professor Bergensfeld, uh, is the NASCI project. And you, you may not have heard.